If you only have one over cosh apples, then you only have one over cosh apples. Okay, one, one times. I hope this does make sense. A huge thanks to my Patreon supporters for making this episode possible. Good morning, fellow mathematicians. Welcome back to another very exciting video on engineering clock. Finally available, limited time off. A lot of them are already gone. So if you didn't pre-order one already, do so. Links everywhere. Once they are gone, they are gone. We are going to talk about an extremely, really, really exciting function today that is so dear to my heart just because it's one of my most favorite functions ever because it yields a secret connection between trigonometric functions and hyperbolic functions. In a normal case, we define them using complex numbers in some way. So plug in a complex argument into trigonometric functions and you are going to get hyperbolic functions out on the other side. But with the function and its inverse we are going to derive today, we can actually define the trigonometric functions through the hyperbolic functions without using complex numbers. It's, it's so crazy, it's so cool and we are going to talk about graphical interpretation of those and it's going to be really exciting. So please keep watching and watch a whole portion of the video. Watch the whole video. Watch time rehabs the channel. We are going to dive right in. We have talked about this function kind of before. We have derived a special value of this function like two or three weeks ago. I'm talking about the integral from 0 to x, so it's parameterized in the upper bound of the hyperbolic secant of t integrated with respect to t. And you see, when we let the limit go to infinity and we took the integral two times, link to the video will be down there at the top of the description, then, well, this integral over the hyperbolic secant yielded pi. So you can already see that there's some weird stuff going on. So pi in the normal case is exclusively, I would say, available to trigonometric functions because they have something to do with the unit circle. But we are integrating over hyperbolic function and we are going to get pi out on the other side. This is extremely curious and this should already get you thinking. Why is it like this? Well, just because of the antiderivative. It's, it actually allows for really elementary antiderivative which is bijective on the whole reals and then we can take the inverse and then we can find some really cool relationships be between hyperbolic and trigonometric functions. Let us dive right in. This thing is called the Gudermannian function of x. GD of x. And we are going to rewrite now the hyperbolic secant as 1 over the hyperbolic cosecant, um, the hyperbolic cosine, I'm terribly sorry, 1 over the hyperbolic cosine cos of t. And now we are going to do some algebraic manipulations to arrive an, at an elementary antiderivative, like I said before. Let us expand this fraction by cos over cos of t. So we can multiply everything by a 1. And this really doesn't change anything. If you only have one over cosh apples, then you only have one over cosh apples. Okay, one, one times. I hope this does make sense. Also, if you don't know about expanding fractions, then take a look at the second channel. I have a lot of great math content over there, Flemmy 2, where, where you do basic mathematics with a touch of rigorousness. So, so it's quite exciting. Take a look over there. All right. So what we are going to end up with right now is the integral from 0 to x of the cosh of t over cosh squared of t integrated with respect to t. Now you might ask yourself how this expression could be modified such that we can get an antiderivative, an elementary one. And well, here's one cool thing. There's actually a hyperbolic version for the fundamental theorem of trigonometry that says that the cos squared of some argument, really doesn't matter, chi, eta, sigma, balls, I don't know, minus the singe, squared of the same argument is equal to 1. And this is really helpful because we have a cos squared down here. Now we can add the singe on both sides to end up with the integra in integra integral from 0 to x of the cos of t over 1 plus the singe squared of t integrate with respect to t. And well, now a really nice substitution just falls from the sky. Namely, we are going to substitute some variable, um, let, I don't know, eta be equal to the singe of t. And now we can differentiate both sides implicitly with respect to t, leaving us with d eta being equal to, well, 
The differential of Sinch is nothing but cos. If you write it in its Euler form, then it just falls from the sky. It's pretty easy to derive. Then we are going to get the cos of t dt. And well, cool thing is we have cos of t up here. So cos of t dt is nothing but d eta, leaving us with um, an integral from, well, if we plug 0 into t, then we are going to get e to the 0 of power minus e to the 0 of power. 1 minus 1 is 0. Okay, this is just going to happen. And well, if we plug x into here, then we just have the sinh of x. Okay, let's let's just um, write it out. Sinh of x is the upper bound. Looking weird, but it is what it is right now. And then we are going to get d eta over 1 plus eta squared. And this thing right here is something I have evaluated and used so often on this channel. Link will be down there at the top of the description. This is nothing but the inverse tangent of eta in this case, from zero to the hyperbolic sine of x. Inverse tangent of zero, okay, it's just going to be zero if you take a look at the graph. So the second part is going to vanish and sinh of x, we can just plug it into here, leaving us with the Gudermannian of x being nothing but the inverse tangent of the hyperbolic sine of x. And by using trigonometric identities and hyperbolic identities, one after another, you can arrive at like 10 or 12 different expressions for the Gudermannian. Really doesn't matter. This is one of the expressions and it does work out. So the Gudermannian is defined as being the inverse tangent of the hyperbolic sine of x, which is really quite interesting. We are now going to take a look at Desmos and see how this thing looks. Now we are going to take a look at our Gudermannian function and it's actually quite interesting and from a few small observations you can already see what the antiderivative is kind of going to be. So let us take a look at uh, Gudermannian at first in, in its integral form and you might notice that this thing looks an awful lot like one branch of the inverse tangent. We are just going to plot the inverse tangent now as it is and that's right here is the inverse tangent. Meaning our Gudermannian is kind of just a deformed inverse tangent wave, which is true because if we take a look at the elementary antiderivative that we have derived before, it's exactly the same as our Gudermannian in its integral form, which should be the case because it's the antiderivative. I mean, it, it does make sense. This is pretty cool. And now I'm going to give everything back to Papa Flemmy and then we are going to see us at the inverse Gudermannian. Pretty interesting, am I right? Now, we are going to apply inverse functions on both sides, one after another, and then we are going to find an explicit integral definition for the inverse Gudermannian. Now, the inverse Gudermannian is basically just our x value in here, okay? This is the function we want to put into the Gudermannian such that we get the identity out on the other side. This is what we are going to do now. We are going to give this whole Gudermannian a new name, just to make the point more clear. We are going to call it y and now we are just going to solve for x. At first we are going to apply the tangent on both sides. That means tangent of y is thus, okay, tangent of inverse tangent is just the argument in itself, leaving us with the sinh of x. And now we are going to apply the area sinh on both sides, so the inverse hyperbolic sine, leaving us with our x value, which is the inverse Gudermannian function, so g to the negative one power of y, being equal to the inverse hyperbolic sine of the tangent of y. And this is what we have at the moment. So this thing, this inverse Gudermannian is basically the antiderivative of an integral definition and this is what we want to find out. And now we are just going to differentiate this thing and integrate it yet again. And then we basically have our definition in integral form. Let us differentiate the inverse hyperbolic sine I have made a video on that before, okay? So if we just um, differentiate that d dy of the inverse hyperbolic sine of the tangent of y, we are going to get, by the video I have done two days ago, you can find the link at the top of the description, we are going to get at first um, 1 over the square root of 1 plus this argument squared, 1 plus tangent squared of y times the inner derivative, which is the derivative of the tangent of y, which is going to be 
secant squared, exactly. So this thing right here is going to be the secant squared of y. I was just kind of confused because I thought I wrote ddx right here, which wasn't the case. Excuse me for that. Now, down here, there's um, like a reformulation of the fundamental theorem of trigonometry for the tangent, saying that the secant squared, what we have up here also is nothing but one plus the tangent squared of y. Meaning, we are going to have the secant squared of y over the square root of the secant squared of y. Down here, we are going to get the absolute value of the secants basically, and then secant squared over the absolute value of the secants is going to give us the absolute value of the secants basically. It really depends where you are, if you just in the positives, it's going to just be the secants. Okay, so overall, we are just going to go for the secants here. Secants of y is the derivative of the inverse Gudermannian. Now we are just going to integrate both sides with respect to some variable. Let's call the upper bound x yet again, leaving us with the integral of d dy of the Gudermannian inverse of y dy is just going to be, and from zero to x, okay, just by the same definition as before, is going to give us just. So if we differentiate the integrand and integrate it yet again, we are just going to get the inverse Gudermannian. And this time, with respect to x, because we have this upper bound here, is thus going to be just the integral from zero to x of the secant of y dy. And isn't that quite interesting? I mean, before we had the Gudermannian being the integral from zero to x of the hyperbolic secant. Now we are having the inverse Gutermannian being the integral from zero to x of just the secant, which is really quite interesting. Let us take a look at Desmos yet again. Now we are going to take a look at the inverse Gutermannian. And one might ask the question at first, how would it look like? And one could do a little wild guess here and say that, well, for inverse functions, it's just a reflection in some point. And for this function, both have zero, zero as a common point, meaning it's probably the point of reflection also. Let us activate both and you might notice that, well, it does work out. It's just a reflection in zero, zero. And you, mo and you might notice something really curious. So, so what I said before is that the Gudermannian it's pretty similar to the inverse tangent in the sense that it's just basically a stretch thing, which does make sense because we just have the cinch in here as an argument. Now, if we take a look at the inverse Gudermannian, it's actually the case that this thing looks way more like the principal branch of the tangent, just a deformed one, which does make sense yet again because the inverse tangent is just a reflection basically here on zero, zero, which is kind of curious. One might think that the inverse cinch, which the inverse Gudermannian is defined by, is going to be like the function of reference here, but it's actually not the case. One other thing that I find pretty curious is if we just were to take a look at a um, little bit of casework, let us not take a look at the two branches up here. If we just take a look at the one branch from negative infinity to zero of the inverse Gudermannian that we have here. And then we're going to do a little bit of casework and take a look at the branch from zero to infinity of the regular Gudermannian. Then we kind of have like a logarithmic curve, just a little bit deformed and a bit shifted, which is actually quite curious. I mean, this, this would be like a really cool function to plot if we just put those in a little bit of casework. Just a little bit, food for thought. Now I'm going to give back to Papa Fleming. He's going to finish the video up. Lastly, you might ask yourself what I was talking about at the beginning, that we can express the hyperbolic or trigonometric functions respectively using the functions we have defined today. And here's basically a little point to get started and then you can just work your way through each and every identity. There are a bunch, all right? So what about applying the tangent to the Gudermannian? Okay, or, the, or we put the Gudermannian into the tension basically. So applying the tension on both sides leaves us with the tension of the Gudermannian of x being equal to the tension of the inverse tension. Okay, it's just the identity, meaning the argument in here is thus nothing but the sinh of x. And this is cool, right? I mean, now we have to find ourselves the sinh 
without using any complex numbers. That is really curious. And now from here, you can go ahead and get started. I mean, the hyperbolic cosine squared was nothing but one plus sin squared. Now you can take the square root and you can express the hyperbolic cosine just using what we have here by putting the new definition for sinh in there. For tangent squared, there's also something cool you can do. I mean, we have the secant squared, yada, yada, yada. And with this way, you can derive each and every hyperbolic function using simply the Gudermannian. The other way around, we can just apply the hyperbolic sine on both sides to the inverse Gudermannian. So the hyperbolic sine of the inverse Gudermannian of x is going to be, well, the tangent of x. Now we have defined ourselves one of the trigonometric functions by using simply the inverse Gudermannian being applied to our hyperbolic sign. And well, now you can just go through the same process as with here, use your regular trigonometric identities and then you can get yourself a whole list of very, very nice looking things nice looking identities. And this basically concludes this video. I just thought that it's really, really interesting to cover the Gudermannian here. I just like this function. I was uh, exploring this, functions, uh, this function for a while now. It's, it's just really cool. I, I knew about it for a, for a few years and, and it's just amazing. In my studies, no one ever talked about the Gudermannian because I don't know, it's maybe just something that physicists use. It's actually the solution to some nonlinear um, to some nonlinear equations, so the differential equations in some way for the inverse pendulum, for example. We covered this in theoretical physics back then. And then the Gudermannian basically popped up, but no one called the Gudermannian, it was just this inverse tangent of the hyperbolic sine, etc. But yeah, this is basically it. This concludes the video. And yeah, if you did like what we did here today, then please like and subscribe, recommend channel, like don't forget engineering world clock go over to the other channel for basic mathematics with a touch of rigorousness and up until next video i wish you guys a flamble day leave some feedbacks down below if you did enjoy this video ciao